And on the fourth speaker, I finally figure out how to record before the speaker starts. Um, welcome back to the second annu annual Taoist Conference hosted by Taoist Gate Center. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, many of you have been through all four talks, which is really wonderful to see. Um, thank you for Zhou Xuan Yun uh, for this morning's talk on understanding and accepting our place within the cosmos, as well as Taoist methods uh, to change one's destiny within that framework. Um, we really appreciate all of you for coming out and we wanna present our last speaker, Lindsay Wei. In a time when spirituality is pre presented in an easy package, often with retreats being held at resorts and in comfortable circumstances, this teacher instead brings the training hall outside and chooses to stretch students' comfort zones. Combining years of learning Taoism and martial arts on a remote peak of China's Wudong mountain range with your experience learning and teaching wilderness skills back in the States, Lindsay Wei truly sees the Tao in everything around her. An author of two books, she runs retreat camps each year in Southern Oregon, bringing together her range of skills into an authentic transformative experience, as well as teaching online through live classes and has a pretty built up archive at this point from teaching pretty prolifically during the pandemic. To paraphrase Dung Ming Dao's words from yesterday's talk, she's someone who finds the seeds of good fortune, even in the midst of apparent misfortune. Instead of dwelling on the loss of her land in a large fire last summer, she is someone who's worked tirelessly to educate and understand how to rewild the land in ways that will serve the wildlife, the forest itself, and future generations of people to come, literally planting the seeds of rebirth in the midst of apparent destruction. So for that reason, she's another teacher that really embodies the tradition. And so she's going to talk about Zhen Wu, who embodies the Wudong tradition. So thank you, Lindsay, and I'll step away. Take it away. Thank you, Sam, um, for that generous introduction. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, Joe Shifu, for hosting this conference and uh, for inviting me to speak. And thank you to the other presenters, Josh Painter and Dung Ming Dao, for everything that they've offered so far. Um, so when I was invited to speak for Taoist Gate, I I wanted to celebrate the Wudong mountain culture because that's where both myself and Master Zhou uh, lived for many years and where our experience of Taoism occurred. Um, and so John Wu is the patron deity of the Wudong mountains. And I think that that plays a uh, uh, a huge influence in what we see today in the link between um, Taoism and the Wudang Gongfu um, and the lineages of uh, the, the Gongfu lineages that still exist to this day in Wudang Shan. And so I'm hoping today to impart some of that culture um, and celebrate uh, the deity Junwu. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen. Is that looking good? Everyone can see that? Okay. So, <clears throat> Zhen Wu, uh, the supreme ancestor of the dark heavens, uh, Xuanten Shangdi, um, has many names uh, because he has had so many transformations throughout time. Um, I chose this as the kind of main slide because this is a lesser uh, used um, translation of the deity's name, but I really feel that this embodies um, and conveys in the English language how I perceive John Wu. Um, he or it, when coming in this kind of uh, theriomorphic form, this animal form of the deity, the turtle entwined with the snake, um, as well as the human form of John Wu, uh, either both of them are really this feeling of an ancestor or feeling of ancient knowledge embodied in this entity. Um, I like the translation dark heavens because um, there's a lot of inner meaning there, sometimes translated as the mysterious heavens or uh, the celestial heavens. But I like the English word dark here just because it has a little bit of that um, kind of taboo edge to it that that beckons you to, to think deeper about what what do we mean by the dark heavens. Um, so really quick, I just want to uh, acknowledge some sources for the information that I'm about to share with you in this presentation. Uh, most importantly, um, I'm 
delivering this information from oral transmission that I received on Wudong Mountains, um, stories told from, you know, an array of different people from uh, pilgrims to teachers, mentors, my own Shifu Li Shifu um, at Five Immortals Temple, um, also ranging to just the, the architecture and iconography that you witness when you're in the Wudong Mountains through temples and statues and murals are all uh, ways in which you're absorbing this, this information or this intelligence of the deities. Um, also from the place itself and from the landscape, from the Wudong Mountains, from all the living creatures that are there, um, ways that you can't really describe how you're you're perceiving these this this kind of information knowing things without knowing how you know them um to me i believe that those communications are coming from the the power of the place itself um and then i also just want to acknowledge uh, my martial brother johan hausen he helped me compile a lot of the images that you're going to see in this slide presentation um and he's always um you know, a friend and colleague who I can bounce ideas off of. Um, and he uh, provided me or linked me to one of the source texts here below. Um, same thing, mentorship from Parting Clouds, Josh Painter, Jack Schaefer and Ross Rosen at Parting Clouds. Um, I've just learned a lot from them over the past six months in their in their program and uh, things, you know, that I didn't know about the Taoist Pantheon and Again, just encouragement and mentorship from them um, also linked me to some of the sources that I used uh, to find kind of the more historical evidence of Shrenwu throughout time. Um, and those two sources are a dissertation by Noel Joffrida, which is uh, really thorough and great. And um, a lot of what I learned about the history of Zhenwu was from that paper. Um, and then also a smaller article by uh, Kretzky that was in the Journal of Tao Studies on the transformations of Xuanwu. So, um, oh wait, hold on. I'm stuck, hold on. Sorry, I have to redo this. I don't know why it, um, there. Okay, we're back. Okay, so um, Xuanwu, when um, first emerges as the turtle and the snake entwined, um, at that time he's known as the dark warrior Xuanwu. Um, this is due to the uh, kind of like the armor and the scales on the turtle and the snake uh, are like that of a warrior. Um, sometimes we refer to the turtle snake entity as itself as Gui Shi. Um, we also have from the previous slide, the Xuan Tian Shang Di. Other ways of translating that is mysterious heavens, highest deity, um, or the highest emperor of the dark heavens or the northern heavens. And so we're actually referring to the northern quadrant of the of the celestial sky um, when we talk about the northern heavens, where the uh, the North Star and the pivot is, uh, where the seven stars of the Big Dipper are. This region is governed by Junwu. So um, in the Song Dynasty, when Junwu transforms from an animal form to a human form deity, um, he starts to be named the True Warrior God or Junwu Da Di. Um, you can translate that also as perfect warrior, perfected warrior. Um, and this is a, an image of Junwu over on the right here uh, with all of his typical iconography, which we'll talk about. But just to point out a little bit, um, often the black flowing robes, the bare feet, disheveled hair, halo, sometimes a crown, um, the quelling demons, uh, hand seal, the sword, and of course, the turtle and snake. Um, so, Zhenwu, Xuanwu um, at that time, um, from ancient times, probably existed all the way back to at least the Neolithic era, uh, but we start to see evidence of Xuanwu in the warring states, um, particularly um, in the Han Dynasty, he appears on bronze mirrors 
paintings, coffins, and tomb bricks. So the bronze mirrors um, are using Shren Wu as um, one of the four spirits of the four directions um, that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but they were used for protection. Uh, and so on these bronze mirrors, and we still see it today, you know, in you know, I think they're made of like wood and they're mirrors, they're like Bagua mirrors that you can buy to ward off demons. Um, <clears throat> so, but they were bronze mirrors back then using the, the four directional spirits to, to ward off demons, um, at, usually at doorways and thresholds. Um, we also have paintings and these coffins and tomb bricks that we see Shren Wu on a lot in the Han Dynasty. Um, again, for protection in the afterlife from the four directional spirits. Um, so, like I said, Shren Wu, the dark warrior, is this entity of the turtle snake. Um, it has this warrior uh, essence because it is a protector of the northern direction. Um, in the north, we associate that with water and the color black, hence the name dark warrior. Um, also the yin quality. And like I said, this is the realm of the seven stars. It's also the, the Northern quadrant of the 28 constellations. Each quadrant has seven constellations and Shren Wu guards over the Northern seven. So then in the Song dynasty is when he becomes an anthropomorphic deity. And this is largely due to visions uh, that emperors were having. Um, the turtle and the snake at that point became his intermediaries, um, his mode of transportation, also sometimes thought of as uh, demonic forces that he then quelled and gained kind of power over. Um, he's also part of the thunder department, um, and this is an important feature for, for Jun Wu. Um, I invite everybody to consider Jun Wu um, as, as an entity or a supernatural force that is manifesting itself in various ways in the minds of the people throughout time. Um, I find it interesting that because it is such an established resonance that it, it manifests itself in the same uh, in the same way throughout time, even just facial features are very specific. Um, and throughout time, uh, John Wu, just like other deities do, um, can merge and morph and, and become one with um, other gods and deities and take on aspects of their identity and also their power and what they represent. So here's some more imagery of of Shren Wu, of the dark warrior, existing as the turtle entwined with the snake. Um, this larger one on the left, I believe, is uh, a tomb brick painting. Um, and if we just kind of like take in, take in this image, a symbol of what's happening here with these these two creatures, um, how they're interacting, the way that they're embraced, and one, two aspects of one entity. Um, we also have uh, the the bronze statue kind of on the bottom right. This is a typical example of something that you might put on your altar. You, you can find these in Wudang Shan. I have one on my altar. Um, and then the top one looks like it's maybe jade or marble. Um, so Jun Wu is part of the four directional spirits. And just to take a little bit of time to explain this, um, like I mentioned, when we look up into the night sky, we see the constellation circling around uh, the, the North Star. Um, and this is why uh, Taoists uh, draw power upon and worship uh, the North Star because it's at the center of our perspective of the universe. And all these constellations are circling around it. Um, and so we have these entities that are protecting those celestial realms, but also us um, as we look out and we perceive these directions that give us a sense of time and space. Uh, so in the north, we have Shren Wu. Um, and you can see that at the bottom there um, in Chinese mapping, north is always at the bottom. It is that yin quality of midnight and winter and the darkness. Um, 
And then we rise up to the east and we see the Qinglong, the green dragon. And then to the south at the top, we have the vermilion bird. And in the west, we have the white tiger. Um, so these four spirits are used for protection and also alchemy. And when you stop to consider that they're protecting the center, um, and the center can be many things. Um, obviously that for protection of self, we are at the center and this is our, our body and our mind, our vehicle for cultivation and how we perceive the world. Um, at center, we also have the Dantian. Um, if you think of it as being um, drawn on tombs and coffins, this is for protection in the afterlife. Uh, but the, the four spirits are also used to protect Taoist ceremonies. So that would be the, the priest or priestess um, on that sacred arena of ceremony being protected by the four entities. Um, and they're also the protector of the void or the origin itself existing at the pole star in the night sky. So here we have an example of just a passage from this uh, text from the Ling Zhu Zouan Shangqing, a Shangqing text uh, that I wanted to share because when I read it, I found it to be very interesting and illuminating, almost one of those uh, moments where you can have like a uh, kind of just like a, an understanding that's hard to put into words. Um, and I started to kind of look after reading this, I started to look at some of these depictions of Jun Wu and questioning, you know, sometimes the turtle and the snake are separated and one is under each foot. Um, and I thought this spoke to that in an interesting alchemical way. So it says, once this is complete, the white pneuma or the breath uh, will suddenly change into the celestial beasts. This is uh, along the path of alchemy, causing the two green dragons to position themselves in your eyes and the two white tigers to place themselves within your nostrils. These should be facing outward. The vermilion sparrow should be above your heart, facing your mouth, the gray green tortoise below your left foot, and the numinous snake below your right foot. So this is kind of describing uh, cryptically uh, some of the mysterious things that may manifest as we kind of continue down the alchemical path. Um, and it's all it's all completely interrelated with the five element theory and the organ systems and how we transform all of that through alchemy. Um, we also see uh, the four spirits in the eight great spirit mantras in the morning scriptures, uh, the Zawang Gongke recited in Taoist temples every morning. Um, in the Jing Shan Shan Zhou, the purifying the body spirit incantation, we call upon um, the the four spirits to protect our true self, our mind and our body. And so that's just a little section right here that I shared. Qinglong Bai Hu Dui Zhang Fan Yun Zhu Jue Xuan Wu Shi Wei Wo Zhan. So this is something that you would encant um, in its entirety, and it's saying it's calling upon the green dragon, the white tiger. And it's describing it as if the power of these entities is like a procession of, of soldiers and flag bearing guards um, all coming to to protect your true self vermilion bird mysterious warrior serve and protect my true self. Uh, so then it's in the Song dynasty that we see. Uh, Shuen Wu transform into Jun Wu um, from this animal form into a human form. Uh, and like I mentioned, this is um, having a lot to do with emperors uh, having visions um, and appealing to Jun Wu to help them with their task of leading the people in the country. Um, there were temples created in honor of Junwu by these emperors. Um, these are some examples. Emperor Taizong, um, again, starts to give national status to the deity. Uh, that's where we start to see like the, the title of emperor um, 
associated with Jianwu. Um, <clears throat> and the turtle and the snake would appear to these emperors in visions as, again, the mediaries uh, or the kind of um, accompaniment to Jianwu. Sometimes Jianwu in the human form wouldn't appear at all, and it would just be the turtle snake representing him. Um, you can start to see here in this in this uh, photo on the side here, this painting, um, you can see the turtle snake underfoot. He's sitting in a throne. He has his male and female attendants to his left and right. And we also start to see uh, the sword bearer and the flag bearer. You can see them um, like a little bit further down into the front there. Um, Jianwu was used to fight off disease um, and also protect the country from northern nomads. Uh, these are the emperors um, that are noteworthy who were venerating Jianwu throughout the Song Dynasty. Um, Emperor Taizong, the second emperor, Emperor Zhenzong, the third emperor, and Emperor Huizong eighth emperor. And then later we're going to talk about um, Emperor Yongle uh, of the Ming Dynasty as being pivotal for Jianwu's association with Wudangshan. So to review the iconography again, um, sometimes when you look at um, depictions of deities, you have to kind of search for some of these uh, kind of descriptive qualities about them to know what deity you're looking at. Um, so Jianwu always um, has long black draping hair. Um, he's typically, but not always, wearing a flowing robe, um, sometimes with the flying ribbons all around. Um, he has the officers that hold a black banner and sometimes his sword. He's typically wearing golden armor or armor of some kind, although there are depictions of him without armor. He almost always has bare feet and a halo, sometimes shown with a jade belt, but not always. Uh, he almost always is grasping a sword or the attendant has the sword. He grasps it in different positions. Um, here he has it pointing down um, and interacting with the turtle and the snake. And so to me, this, this depiction of Jianwu um, is kind of speaking towards uh, how he, Later in his kind of legends and lore, um, the turtle and the snake uh, become these demonic forces, these demonic aspects of his own cultivation that he then um, gains control over and transform, transforms within himself. So in a way here I see this sword um, kind of quelling those, those inner demons um, and having control over them. Um, so, and of course, we always see the snake and the turtle um, underfoot, if not actually underneath his feet. Uh, sometimes we see one foot up and one foot down. Um, and sometimes, uh, like I mentioned, we're gonna see uh, a snake under one foot and a tortoise under one foot. Sometimes they're switched. There's been a little bit of inconsistency there, um, but we also in this particular one have uh, the element of water. Um, that is associated with Jianwu. Uh, so sometimes we see Jianwu without the robes, uh, without the armor, um, and more in this kind of sage-like way, less uh, warrior-like. Um, and again, here we can see the flag bearer and the sword attendant uh, to his left and right. We still see the black robes and the turtle and the snake underfoot. Uh, so Jianwu is associated with the Thunder Department, um, which is this complex system of deifying thunder, and there's many members of the Thunder Department. Um, and here's a, a excerpt from uh, the Shangqing Tianxin Zhengba uh, text, and it says Jianwu is 100 feet tall with disheveled hair in golden armor. He steps on the numinous turtle of five colors which is also known as the turtle of the eight trigrams, encircled by a leaping snake. One of his hands forms a seal of pacifying demons. Lightning comes out of his eyes. The other hand holds a sword as he stands still. 
So in this painting, we see again all of his typical iconography. He's holding his sword and uh, this text is describing his hand seal as the pacifying demon's hand seal. It changes slightly here and there in different uh, depictions of John Woo, which is interesting. Um, we have his sword bearer and his flag bearer to his left and right. Um, and then we have members of the Thunder Department that become his entourage as he gains uh, status in the Pantheon. He, he kind of goes from being a, a member of the Thunder Department to being um, more elevated and having the members of the Thunder Department as his entourage. So um, here we have a uh, this is a kind of like an accordion style woodblock print that has all the members of the Thunder Department on it. And so the one on the right there is John Woo, and you can tell from his iconography. Um, <clears throat> and this is an important um, text for the Thunder Rites. This is the Yushu Jing, um, the Jade Pivot scripture. And um, it's talking here about, again, how Thunder became deified. Um, and that these complex systems of this divine bureaucracy uh, was created, um, the Thunder Department or Leibu, um, where it is then populated with a host of Thunder deities, officials, soldiers, and assistants. Um, Taoist practitioners of the past and also of modern day um, summon members of the Thunder Department to intervene in the world. Um, they could be called upon to bring rain and exercise demons um, that cause illness and misfortune for individuals, families, and communities. Um, there are thunder rituals, leifa, um, involving hand seals, incantations, talismans, self-cultivation, and inter -al inner alchemy, um, all the fundamental skill sets of, of a Taoist practitioner. Um, the Thunder Department really has a lot of martial deities uh, within it because this, this kind of represents their protective and exorcistic prowess. Um, that they're able to wield this sword of wisdom to quell demons and, and drive out uh, illness and misfortune. So, um, so we have Jun Wu here, and it's uh, it just so happens that next to him is Dong, uh, yeah, Dong Hua Jiao Zhu, um, another member of the Thunder Department. Um, and just somewhat noteworthy, I wanted to mention that also in this same woodblock accordion uh, style print, um, other members that you might recognize their names of that are in the Thunder Department um, are Zhang Daoling and also Ling Guanye. So I just listed their names below. So Jun Wu is also part of the Sesheng, the Four Saints or the Four Sages. Um, they served Zhe Wei Beiji Dadi, the great emperor of the Purple Tenuity. Um, those four saints are Jun Wu, Tianpeng, Tianyo, and Yisheng. Um, and again, these the history of these members goes very far back, um, but the evidence and recognition is again from the Song Dynasty. Um, and here again, we just see that they, they possess exorcistic powers and they vanquish demons uh, that are causing harm to the land and to the people. Um, he's again described as a martial figure with uh, loose hair and bare feet, golden armor. These are all just to kind of reaffirm that um, in all of his manifestations, he has the same appearance. Uh, <clears throat> so as he rises in, uh, in the Pantheon, um, he is kind of promoted out of this four saints that served Zoe Beiji Dadi and he becomes sort of his own um, supreme emperor. Um, and this is when he starts to be associated with the Wudong Shan, with the Wudong Mountains in Hubei province. And finally, um, he becomes elevated to being a reincarnation of Taishang Laojun, um, which is one of the three treasure gods, these pre-heaven forces that uh, are kind of the, 
the origin of the Tao itself, uh, Yuan Shi Tianzun, Ling Bao Tianzun, and Tao De Tianzun, um, also known as Tai Shang Lao Jun. Many people know the manifestation of Lao Tzu um, and the, the treasure of the teachings um, as the, the main manifestation of Tai Shang Lao Jun. But here we're seeing that at some point, Zhang Wu becomes the 82nd manifestation of Tai Shang Lao Jun. Um, so we see Xuan Wu rise from this theriomorphic deity uh, entity, protector of the four directions, um, to being a member of the four saints serving the, the Zewei Beiji Dadi, to being a member of the Thunder Department, <laughs> So then being elevated to a manifestation of one of the highest uh, pre-heaven entities of the Tao. Um, so we see evidence of this in um, several different texts. We also see it in the evening scripture, uh, the Wanke, in the Precious Declaration of the Northern Sky, the Xuan Hian Bao Gao, um, where it states, Ba Shi Er Hua, San Jiao Zu Shi, the 82nd transformation master of the three faiths. And here he is again with his black flag bearer, his sword bearer, um, and his entourage from the Thunder Department. So this is just a little note on his attendants um, so that you can see their, their names. Um, there's the Yunu and Lingguan, uh, more generic um, attendants that many deities have. Um, but then we have these specific ones, um, the Zhiqi and the Pengjian um, that carry the flag and the sword for Zhen Wu. So uh, finally, we get to the Ming Dynasty and Emperor Yongle. And Emperor Yongle really venerated Zhen Wu and attributes Zhen Wu to having um, assisted him to his rise to the throne, assisted him in all of his um, endeavors to rule the people. Um, again, protecting from northern intruders, uh, and it was it was Emperor Yongle who really made Wudang Shan the center of this deity's cult. Um, there was a huge building campaign um, where eighteen different emperors from the Ming Dynasty made large donations to Wudang Shan. All of the temples in Wudang Shan. Um, such as Zixiao Gong, but also Tai Zipo and Nanyan, uh, Wulong Gong, they all received these, these donations from the Ming Dynasty emperors um, to celebrate Zhen Wu and worship Zhen Wu. Um, they, they donated the, the statues. Uh, many of them also donated statues of the, the thunder deity uh, entourage um, of Zhen Wu. Uh, sometimes they uh, gave specific statues of the turtle snake and many other uh, ritual implements. So this is a picture of the Xiaogong or the Purple Heaven Palace in Wudang. Um, this is a beautiful ornate temple, huge statue of Zhen Wu inside. Um, I wasn't able to find any photos of that because typically we don't um, take photographs of the altar itself, but um, I love this photo because it really kind of shows that link between the Wudong Kung Fu and the Taiji practice and that culture that exists today in Wudong Shan that perhaps emanated from this long history of worshiping this martial deity and cultivating ourselves in his likeness, um, aspiring towards what he represents. This is the Jinding. Um, the golden peak at Wudang Shan. Uh, in this golden uh, halt on the left that you see is another uh, bronze statue that was donated from the Ming emperors. Um, it's a very long walk to get up to the top of central Wudang Mountain here. And as you can see, it is, it's an elaborate uh, kind of collection of buildings up here um, and a wall encircling the peak. Um, and this is all due to, to that, uh, all those donations from the Ming Dynasty emperors venerating Zhen Wu. So here's a photo of Wulong Gong. Um, this is the Five Dragon Temple in Wudang Shan. This is a little bit more off the beaten path. Um, 
it's been renovated this this angle kind of shows more of the ruins of it um, but we can see the five dragon springs there uh, those wells that you see um and this is an important place um in Junwu's hagiography uh we can read about it in the journey to the north the the Beoji, um where it's telling about uh his story of so Junwu um is simultaneously paralleling this deity um, as a human, an actual human that was born onto earth, um, who was born a prince and then leaves home to cultivate in the Wudong Mountains. Um, there's there's so many stories about Zhang Wu and his cultivation in Wudong Shan that uh, I'll share some today, but there's too numerous to share them all. Um, but generally, he cultivated for 42 years. Um, and at which point the Jade Emperor um, bestows immortality uh, upon him and names him the Great Dark One. Uh, where his actual uh, location of ascension is, I can't specifically say. Some uh, you know, records here are, are attributing it to, to Wulong Gong where this picture is. Um, but when living in Wudong Shan, I would also hear stories of his ascension occurring here. Um, this is Nanyang Gong. This is the Southern Cliff Grotto. Um, and you can see like that there's this precipice that you can walk out onto um, with an incense cauldron at the, at the edge of it. Um, and this is part of one of uh, Jun Wu's ascension stories that I heard very early on in, in Wudong Shan when I was training there. Um, so this story is that Zhen Wu had been cultivating for many years. Um, he sat in meditation on the edge of a cliff. Uh, the Jade Emperor decides to test him and he has this vision of a woman in red uh, who wants to brush his hair. And he feels this human desire um, coming up even after all of his years of cultivation and frustrated with this he he pushes the woman who then falls off the cliff and then he himself jumps off as well um and it's in this moment uh that the five dragons appear from the mist and they lift him up into the heavens and at this point he is elevated into the status of immortal um We also have, uh, I wanted to share some legends and lore uh, from the White Horse Mountain, uh, which is the most westerly of the Wudong Mountain Range, um, has 72 peaks, and this one is to the west. And it's said that Jun Wu, uh, when traveling to look for a place to cultivate, he first came to the White Horse Mountain. Um, and so again, this is where I trained. Uh, this is where the Five Immortals Temple is. It's not in central Wudong. Um, it's it's kind of a little bit, yeah, more further away. Um, but Jun Wu passed by here uh, and cultivated here for some time before moving on to the central Wudong Shan. So I wanted to share this uh, story with you. And so this is, you know, things that I was steeped in every time that I walked um, the path up to the top of the mountain to where the temple was. Um, these are the stories that are playing out as you walk the path and you see the landscape uh, because it's all linked to the story of, of where Jun Wu walked uh, his footsteps and how his path uh, played out um, his journey. So Grandmaster Jun Wu was searching for the perfect place to cultivate. Um, he passed by the Yellow Dragon Beach. This is the, the Yellow Dragon River is uh, behind the Bai Ma Shan. Um, and he was touched by the sight of Bai Ma Shan. Um, he looked at it in the distance and it looked as if it extended all the way up into the sky, surrounded by moving clouds that looked like wild heavenly horses flying across the celestial sphere. Um, this graceful scenery invited him into staying and cultivating for a while. He holds the leash of his white horse, um, the reins, and the and he the grandmaster goes up the rugged mountain, stamping a series of horse footprints on the stones that lied over it. Those stones were later called horse trodden stones. 
As he entered the gate of the heavenly valley and arrived at the front of the little gate of heaven, the Grand Master accidentally trods loose a big and square stone. The stone rolls downhill and lays down at the entrance of the gate of the heavenly valley. And this stone was named Lan Ma Shi, the gate stone. The gate stone had been used to subdue a century old demonic tortoise. And at that moment, the tortoise uh, realize that the stone was gone and tries to escape and uh, resume being evil. Um, however, the Grand Master with one foot stomps on it and says, I'll go up the mountain and cultivate and you shall stay here and be the guide to the heavenly gate of the entrance of the mountain. And the tortoise instantly turned into a huge stone, it stretched its long neck and laid on its stomach. And there it lies in front of the little gate of heaven. Um, this place where the tortoise uh, guides the gate was named as Shou Man Shou. And so here we see like another manifestation in story and myth of, of how Jun Wu um, encounters demonic forces and is able to pacify them and then turn them into his servants who then become protectors of the mountain gate. So here I have a picture of Li Shifu. Um, I found this to be an interesting just parallel because again, as we as we look to these deities as archetypes or models for how we're going to live or cultivate, um, we we become as if their likeness. And here we have a living Taoist um, on his white horse at White Horse Mountain, continuing the tradition to today. This horse um, was a rescue horse from uh, Southern China um, and her name was Bai Long, White Dragon. So back to the story of Jun Wu, um, having passed the little gate of heaven, he continues to the side of a waterfall where the mountain becomes very precipitous and he has to hold the reins of the horse with one hand and grab the rocks of the cliff with the other. His left hand made impressions in the rocks, which can be clearly recognized as one sees the shapes of fingers on the cliffs. Um, this was named Shopaya, hands grabbing cliff. Uh, and since then, when tourists walk by, they touch the rocks and they say, here, I take a break and I touch the handprints on the rocks and demons will stay away from me. Um, and they believe by touching these rocks where Jun Wu once touched, it will disperse evil and maintain health. So then we continue the narrow road in the valley, uh, gradually growing wider as we enter the second gate of heaven and the Grand Master ties his horse on a stone pillar, now called Shuan Ma Shi, tying the horse stone. On the side of the road, his horse drinks from a spring, which is now called Yin Ma Tao, horse watering trough, and he takes a rest. He continues his way, passing the third gate of heaven uh, through the Eagle Mouth Stone and to the Five Green Slope, following the Black Dragon Ridge, uh, he comes to a place later called Horse Running Root. Um, this was actually a place of thorny plants where he had to cut out a road um, and he would whip the thorns and the vines that were blocking him. Um, and before long, the plants blocking the way were whipped to both sides and a flat road appears. Um, and uh, so, and we see so things like that, that, that whipping the thorns uh, away, we, we actually even see that later showing up in the names of martial movements in our forms. Um, and all of this story is also paralleling the path of cultivation. Um, these gates that we're passing through, the things that we need to do internally and on our, on our path, um, that will refine who we are and and what we are as humans with a body and a mind um, so he continues and he finally finds a, a flat spot and here he builds a temple where he can begin to cultivate um, so this spot uh, these are pictures of the modern day version of this place where he cultivated um, where temples have been built multiple times over this is the current uh, the current one um, so no one knew how long had passed. Jun Wu was cultivating. Um, and one night he suddenly awakened by the loud horse neigh. Um, and the body of the mountain crashes down and leans towards the east. And rocks are flying and rolling down the hill. Um, 
the Grand Master acquires this great power of the Tao um, and his celestial, his body has so much weight that uh, the mountain can no longer hold it and it crumbles. Um, and uh, so this, you can see uh, in present day that there is a section of the mountain that is uh, all crumbled rock um, and you pass by it when you, when you walk up. Um, and so we have the launch to draw, and then we also have the place where he, the cracked and golden saddle is still sitting on the top of the mountain. And that's a picture of, of the horse's saddle there on the bottom right. Um, and so later temples were erected to honor this place where Jun Wu cultivated. Uh, and this is the current version of the Jun Wu Dian on the peak of White Horse Mountain. Here's another photo of it. Um, this is where uh, many of us who are students of Li Shifu spent many mornings uh, running up to the peak to do our standing meditation and gaze at the rising sun. Um, the bottom picture, you can kind of see the view over the yellow Dragon River uh, where Jun Wu first passed by um, and then came up to the top here to cultivate. Um, Let's back up a second. Um, so Jun Wu later uh, continued on to Wudong Shan because this mountain crumbled and he decided it wasn't uh, as peaceful enough of a place to cultivate. And so he continued on to what is now the central Wudong Shan. And there's so many stories that are similar uh, when you, you know, walk the paths of Wudong Shan, it's all following in his footsteps. Um, <clears throat> and what I love about this type of myth is that it it gives these landmarks um, or actual landscape around us, um, animating the landscape around us, but also giving cryptic hints into our internal path uh, that we're walking in cultivation. So um, more stories, I have two more stories of Jun Wu. Um, this one is the story of Jun Wu washing his viscera. Um, and, so I like this one because it's 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 going to give a sense of what the turtle and the snake represent um, as far as being uh, part of our body, the representation of our body and the cultivation of our body. So the story goes that Jun Wu um, is cultivating and he's frustrated with his own emotions, which exist inside of our organs. Um, those who've studied the five element theory know all of these organ associations with the emotions. Um, and so Jun was frustrated. He cannot overcome his, his own emotional landscape. And so he goes down to the river to wash his viscera. He actually opens his stomach and he thinks if I wash, you know, these organs, perhaps I can, um, cultivate above my, my own emotional landscape. And, um, however, then his organs escape as these demons, um, as the turtle and the snake. Um, and they begin haunting the towns and, and causing disease and death. Um, and so the gods tell Jun Wu that he, he needs to, to deal with this. Um, so then Jun Wu goes to, to gather his demons um, and is able to, again, subdue them and take control of them and make them his, his workers, his, his guardians, he he grasps hold of that and transforms it. Um, and this is again a representation of our cultivation. So then another uh, symbology of Shren Wu and the turtle snake uh, is of the mind itself of the human evolution, uh, the evolution of the human brain. Um, so you can kind of see the likeness here in this shape. Um, and it's as if the snake is this um, reptilian aspect of the brain. Um, down here, the line is kind of pointing in the wrong direction, but the reptilian complex is the, um, the base of the brain there, uh, that pink and red section. Um, and this is our, go back and forth between these two slides. So this is where our primal instinct comes from um our reptilian brain and it's like it's that energy of the snake kind of rising up the spine coming up into the upper dantian um and so we have we have these kind of 
primal instincts that govern us. But then as the human brain evolves over time, we develop the mammalian brain and we have emotions and feelings. And then we develop the neocortex, um, which allows us to have uh, like decision making, free will, language, sensory perception, spatial reasoning. And so that to me is kind of like the turtle um this this further evolution of our intelligence as humans um and this this interaction between those two forces of our ability to make decisions and have free will um mixed and intertwined and one with our basic instincts um our reptilian instincts our animal instincts these two aspects of the human mind intertwined as one so in these uh, ways, we can see uh, some of the other meanings that we can glean from this image of the turtle and the snake. So kind of coming to a close here, this is a picture again of, uh, from White Horse Mountain, the peak of White Horse Mountain. Um, where we again just see the likeness of these stories in the features of the landscape. This is a turtle rock. Um, I believe the story here is that when Jun Wu left to cultivate in central Wudong, he left behind a turtle general and a snake general to guard over this location. Um, so we see kind of that likeness of the turtle head here. And now this is a place where those who follow in all of the years after Jun Wu can also cultivate. And here are some photos of modern day living Taoism. Uh, this is my Shifu at the Five Mortals Temple. Um, here he is taking incense up uh, a blank planchette where he is um, drawing talisman uh, with his mind and then delivering them into the celestial realms via the incense stick. Um, in the picture on the left, he's preparing prayer paper to burn um, after this incense ceremony uh, that I believe here is a, many of the foreign students um, offering incense at the altar and he's blessing these um, headbands that each student got uh, with a trigram or a hexagram um, on it that they drew from the I Ching. Um, and then the bottom picture is just a picture of me from a long time ago uh, in seated meditation, looking out over the sunset, over the yellow dragon river from the Jun Yen at the peak of the mountain. And these are just some other photos that I came across. So we're back at Wulong Gong now in central Wudong, uh, the Five Dragons Temple. Um, and this is also a Jun Wu hall, uh, a hall devoted to Jun Wu. And here we just see uh, a living example of what it looks like in present day to to worship this deity of the true warrior, uh, the dark warrior, um, with uh, so much reverence, really. Um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> to kind of bring this into summary, um, you know, in the context of, of this conference and what it means um, to practice Taoism in a post pandemic world or how can Taoism serve our current world that we find ourselves in. Um, for me it's about looking back uh, at our ancestry looking back towards tradition to find models for living, and I think that the most important part of that. Um, is at the center of it, having this connection to the sacred and this reverence for the sacred, um, re-inspiring that within all of us as humans on earth. Um, so I hope that this presentation has shown you how uh, Taoism as a lived tradition is a form of ancestor worship, um, but ancestors can come in, in many forms. They don't have to be these human deities necessarily. They can be these aspects of our own body and mind. Um, they can be these very ancient um, animal representations that are protectors of us. Um, a Taoist altar um, is a way in which we can communicate with those ancestors or those entities. Um, 
by erecting a Taoist altar, we can then further and actually literally feed the sacred through offerings of incense and fruit and flower. And this is how it has been done um, for many, many years in the Taoist tradition. Um, and through retelling and contemplating these stories, for me, I believe that it, it inspires aliveness for me. Um, it, it inspires me on my path. And as I've said, gives me a model for, for how to cultivate. Um, I think it's important and Jun Wu represents this, um, the cultivation of the strength of your mind and body. Um, martial training, martial culture represents um, that embodiment of skill. And through this, you, you gain a type of power and a type of wisdom um, that is very embodied um, and very present. It's also this great test of character and what you're willing to endure, uh, what your work ethic is, um, because I think that that translates really well to the stillness cultivation um, and that perseverance and willpower that you need, um, that faith um, and that discipline that you need in, in the same way uh, through the seated meditation or the stillness practices. Um, really it's through training of the, the body that we actually encounter the mind a lot of the time um if you think about like going for a long run it's really the mind that we encounter first as being the hurdle that we have to get through um so this martial culture as we see it in the deity general represents um the safeguarding of that of the sacred um Again, in our post pandemic world, I believe that nurturing interconnectedness um, and looking towards indigenous worldviews, which includes a, a Taoist worldview, um, is important. And to question and be cautious of anything that you can identify that would strip us from that direction um, or distract us or cancel our connection to that. Um, how do we reestablish that connection with the sacred um if if we feel that that and maybe collectively we can all agree that we feel that that has been um there's been a, a break or a, a damage to that connection in our modern day um so i believe that um healing um is actually what uh we need to do we need to find in uh, individually inside of ourselves where did that connection to the to the sacred get severed and why um i think for a lot of people um it's uh issues of trust you know so we've lost trust in that formless realm at some point in our life maybe based off of other religions that we've experienced or we were raised with um and so it's about healing that and then reconnecting to it in in a different way um so i think it's important um to remember mythology um because it's it's actually remembering the past and in these myths and stories and embodiments in the landscape and these um visual cues that we get from statues and symbols um it's inside of those um, that there's an intelligence being held um, and kept and then communicated to the human mind um, throughout time. And so these stories are like memories that are like seeds, like little time capsules with intelligence inside of them, like the DNA of our ancestors, our formless ancestors, such as deities. Um, Finally, I think that um, ecological connectivity is interrelated to all of this. Um, it's fundamental. I think that that comes again to how can we respect the earth if we've lost all of our ways of, of communing with it and connecting to it? How can we then respect it and, and uh, tend to it properly? Uh, I also believe that um, we need to turn back to um, more nature-based living um, because especially along this path of cultivation, um, all of this wisdom and power exists in these natural forces such as thunder, lightning, that it's in the mountains, it's in the caves, it's in the trees. Um, 
And so if we're not there to commune with these things or witness these things, then, then we're missing out on this, um, this wisdom that is held in it. And finally, um, I just wanted to kind of share a little bit of, you know, my vision board of what Western Taoism uh, needs moving forward. I think uh, most importantly, the cultivation of respect, humility, and authenticity. Um, so respect for the tradition might mean um, educating yourself on its history, um, putting in time uh, to perhaps learning the language, um, learning all the intricacies of the philosophies involved in Taoism, approaching with humility, um, <clears throat> cultivating humility, and then gaining authenticity again through your studies and through your practice um, so that you become a skilled embodiment of what the tradition is. Um, and then you become authentic. Um, so I think that we also need living examples. I think this conference is a great, um, it, it does all of these things that I think that Western Taoism needs. Um, so we need living examples of practitioners to look to. And in the meantime, we can look <laughs> to the deities. Um, I believe that we in the West uh, for Taoism to really uh, take on an authentic uh, feeling, uh, we need temples established um, in, in the likeness to what we've seen in some of these slides. Uh, and if you think about how, how much time has uh, passed with and the history and the emergence of Taoism and these temples and these places where you can go and really feel it through through the power of place and in a proper context. I think that context is really something that's missing in Western Taoism. And so I think the establishment of temples um, can help remedy that lack of context. Uh, so same idea, we need places for practice uh, of these life ways um, and community to practice that with. Um, I think that recentralizing uh, native Chinese Taoists that are living in America um, and celebrating them and and bringing some central focus to them, uh, it can um, really bring more aware awareness um, to Western Taoism and making Taoist teachings in America accessible to Asian communities, something that um, where we can diversify this community. And I think standards, high standards um, for the discipline and proficiency and fundamental skill sets of, of Taoism. Um, and in order to, uh, to execute that, we need quality instructors, uh, quality instruction and opportunities for everyone to, to learn and be educated. Um, so that's a bit of a trajectory um, visioning that I've had, and that uh, brings us to a close. Um, and can open it up now to question or dialogue. Yeah, so we'll we'll go similar uh first of all thank you Lindsay for that talk uh really appreciate you speaking to like all these different levels for context you know you brought it back home at the end with that mention of cultural context and place context and how many things uh within this tradition are planting seeds within a practitioner's subconscious um uh, that you know somebody who is looking at it from afar might not even be aware of um but as far as questions we'll go probably the way we're usually going um since we have so many people here and sometimes unmuting microphones can be a little bit wonky. So we're going to have folks, if you have questions, put them in the chat or even comments uh, and we'll go back and forth like that. I see, um, you know, Anna's a hand raised. I'm, a, you know, yeah, yeah. So I'll just kind of watch the chat and let's have some things roll in. Sound okay for you, Lindsay? Yeah, that's great. Um, I would also love to um, invite uh, Joe Shifu, if you have any stories that you wanted to share about Junwu, I'm sure you have some that weren't mentioned today. That would be lovely if you think of any. <laughs> Let's see. 
let me make sure he's unmuted. He's under a different Zoom handle right now. So one sec. There we go. Like before, I thought maybe like after the conference finished, maybe some people, uh, if someone to stay a little bit talk, we can stay here a little bit talk. Uh, absolutely, Sandy, you are very, very amazing. You know, actually, I learned something from you here, from you, you know, it's, a, it's a really good uh, your talk, you know, your speech are very, very amazing. Um, and then, you know, I, I was living in Wudan like many, many years, like Bama Mountain. So because of the Bama Mountain, the, uh, like a temple of Li Shifu, uh, I hear he's a lot, a lot of time, you know, I just, they're too busy and a little bit far away from the main temple main temple i usually live in the just like a purple temple and at the top i live there so uh amazing you know uh, all the people talking about the Shifu, he's very very good so um about the Zhengwu, i i just want to say you know this is because how to say it's the religion part it's the religion part so what's called uh, the beginning of a way uh, we're talking about uh, kind of like uh, you know totem worship totem worship all from there. It's like uh, before kind of like a shaman, everything from there, we cut like a different direction. But uh, we say, uh, you hear talking about the dark, uh, talking about the dark warrior. So for us, uh, but because it's a different color, you know, the four direction, different color. The dark is nurse, means no, no but the dark is a dark warrior because dark we call the, like uh, the black stone. We always call the black, the, the black stone, we call the Xuan Wu Shi, it's the, like a Xuan Wu stone. It means the power, it's a very, um, uh, the black is the power, it's the mean power, it's the strongest power. It's kind of like that. If someone do Feng Shui, you will know that, you know, always see the, it's the part that you can, the black um, stone always in the mean temple, or the temple of the house or the mean area. Either the Xuan Wu is the main area. It's very cool. So you talk a lot of story, actually. <laughs> it's cool. So after someone do the feng shui, uh, of course, another area where we said the beginning of um, eat the religion uh, in the Wudang, you not know, like just in Wudang, yeah, different dynasty, different dynasty. The emperor that always like, uh, in, like a, like a Xi Wang Mu, if someone know, well know the Xi Wang Mu, a different dynasty, the, Picture the statue always different because all from uh, you know the, the emperor imagine nations. Okay, the picture is supposed to show like that, the show like that. They always draw off everything a little bit different. You know, all you throw all the picture, we can see a little bit different. Mm -hmm. The show will always believe, you know, as in China, I would just say if the warrior or someone of the warrior also believe for the uh Xuan Wu, uh, the Zheng Wu, we can can give the power. Yeah. Also, like um, um, for another, so, so, uh, of do someone do the feng shui, also use the Xuan Wu, like Xuan Wu stone. Over you, the Xuan Wu statue can change the feng shui, everything different. So, um, I like Guan Gong, you know, this Guan Gong, I want to talk about another the statue. It's so fun. It's like a, we call it the, uh, the police office in Hong Kong, everywhere. You know, either the police officer that you know, uh, hold the main area that have Guan Gong. And for some of the mafia, like the mafia, they also have the Guan Gong in the main area. Some of the rich people also have the Guan Gong, you know, for the main area, a uh, main room. The, you know, it's all like different. The, uh, the Xuan Wu is the same. Uh, for us, it's the same one with Xuan Wu, kind of like. Uh, Notice more think about the philosophy because the notice means water. The water is more power. We all from the water. Water is everything. You know, so we are practical martials. We always believe for the water. Everything. It, it's cool. I, I learned a lot from you, you know, today. <laughs> it's cool. So uh okay. Um I don't know, maybe someone have a question I can ask you. You know, or, or maybe after we conference we can. If someone wants to stay a little bit, we can talk. And the next year, we will still, we'll still have the conference. If someone, you know, uh, I want to say, if someone uh, went to, you know, belong to the conference, can talk about the UAD, you also can email for us, you know, we share with the community, kind of like, you know, that is a conference, like share the knowledge, share everyone, you know, different point of view. What do you think about the Taoism or the healing, everything? I like people to share for each other. You know, and uh, after that, no, I think I still uh, like a short turn about the questions. You know? 
Okay, Sam? Okay. Yeah, why don't we do questions and then if folks want to stick around and uh, just, you know, be in dialogue with each other, we can, uh, you know, drop the formality of the conversation and go from there. Uh, Mary is asking uh, if there are certain forms or movements within the forms that are specific to Janmu uh, from, from the traditions that you teach. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the first thing that's coming to mind is one of the sword forms that we do where um, the opening of the form is calling upon the power of the North. Um, and we hold a, a similar hand seal, not the exact same one as the demon quelling one that he holds, but a very similar hand seal um, is essentially the opening of the form. And so from, from the very opening movements of the form, it's about conjuring that power of the North um, through Shrenwu. Um, and then we see it in, again, like the, the names for the forms. Um, as they evolve through time, um, can represent different parts of Chinese culture, uh, but in, in the Wudong Taoist forms, um, we have all these references, again, to alchemy and to the deities and to um, the Taoist tradition as names uh, for these movements that we're playing out um, because they're still closely linked to uh, ceremony um, and kind of opening the space uh, by drawing symbols on the ground, using incantations and hand seals. Um, and so it's all completely interlinked with the with the tradition and there's definitely places where um, we make reference to these stories and myths um, sometimes I don't even realize it until you know you know reading something like that the Baimashan lore of Junwu and he's hacking away the brambles and thorns and we literally have a movement uh, named after that um, you know and that that's kind of this reflection of our cultivation where we're, we're refining the self we're hacking away these parts of ourselves that are like thorns or weeds and brambles that are like stagnating um, our, our circulation. Um, yeah so so absolutely it's all um, interrelated uh, with the with the martial forms. Awesome yeah thanks for uh, elaborating on that. Anne is asking, at this time, it appears that we are in a tenuous and tight situation in terms of China and the West, uh, especially the US relationship. How are we contemplating the development and maturation of integrity to the original roots of Taoism in Western Taoism when the geographic and sociopolitical situation exerts such strong pressure on the culture of our people, especially if we are of Chinese descent or even Chinese immigrants ourselves? Yeah, I mean, I think that for for us to uh, restore that, we have to look at some of our um, social political systems um, and how they are racialized, um, and that certain minorities are are uh, marginalized and don't have the same access to to things as the majority does. Um, and so redistributing this, um, and I'm suggesting in a small way, uh, just through our own um, through our own self awareness of how we move through the world, um, what types of contexts are we in, and as teachers, what type of contexts are we creating? Um, are we creating a Western Taoism community that includes all ethnicities um, that maybe goes out of its way to include um, the Asian communities um, and again uh, celebrate and uplift them um, and listen to what they might have to say. Um, these are the suggestions I have and each individual working on understanding um, their relationship to to systems of uh, racism that we've been kind of indoctrinated into, um, born into, um, how that affects how we perceive the world, um, or how that affects how we perceive something like a religion such as Taoism. And I think, again, through earnest study, um, time spent and humility, uh, we can create a community that we're proud of, uh, a community that's diverse, um, that represents all uh, the people who are present here, you know, at least on this continent. Um, 
looking into the history of our country um, and what it, you know, what we're standing on, um, healing some of that trauma. Um, and again, so creating a community where we can be proud of it, um, where people have access to authentic teachings and um, have the ability to study them well um, and devote time to it so that the people in the community are um, authentic representations of the tradition. Um, yeah, those are those are my ideas. I think that it's a, you know, we should all um, be brainstorming this, I think, and making, um, you know, taking actionable steps to remedy and heal it. Um, and I think just kind of bringing it up is maybe even the first step. So I appreciate everyone, you know, being, being willing to kind of open this discussion. Um, as far as our relationships with China right now, it is, it is, it's an interesting issue because uh, where where it comes up for me, uh, for the most part, is that I don't have the ability to actually tr travel now to that homeland of this uh, spiritual tradition that I'm part of. Um, so I don't know how that's going to play out in the coming years. Um, maybe we can have some predictions <laughs> made, uh, some fortune telling. Uh, but, you know, presumably it will, with time, um, clear up and, and that ability to, to go to the homeland is um, intact again. Uh, and, but in the meantime, I think, you know, we have now, uh, because of the pandemic, because we're able to have these um, global remote conversations such as this conference. Um, it's brought the Taoist community together uh, quite a bit, actually. I'm in contact now with so many more Taoist practitioners than I was previously because of our ability to meet like this. So I think it's um, a really you know, ripe and fertile time for Taoism and for us to um, use intention of how we want to see it emerge in the West, because I think it's still in its like beginning stages of emergence totally thanks for the thoughtful answer and for the question uh and had a follow-up question uh, I said, uh discussing uh, oh yeah joseph thank you so it's um yeah it's a really really difficult uh, the east west in uh, china america so it's more like uh, like me you know suppose every year i travel back to china so no i just totally can't it's because I take it too expensive, and in the quarantine, you know, like uh, over ten days, it's too much lose. And where we lose time, uh, from my point of view, you know, just do what we can do. So, but you know, all the cultures, as the human soul, do what we can do because we do the Taoism, we do the healing. All the part is good for people, good for the human. So, whatever Chinese government and America, American government, you know, politics, uh, I say, it sucks, you know. But this is what just do what we can do. And because all the people need the culture, just say, because we do good stuff, we know like the politics, all the bad stuff. I don't think so the government or something say, okay, you guys supposed to stop. We just don't care the politics, just do what we can do. That's my open of view. Of view. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure, uh, I was just gonna ask Anne's follow-up question. Um, and she was asking if we could discuss, and maybe, you know, up to you, uh, if you want to hold this, if people have time afterwards, it sounds like a further dialogue, this whole conversation, you know, we could go on for, you know, quite some time, I think, exploring some ideas as a group, but um, she was asking if we could discuss how we hold together as a community in this situation. You may have already touched on that a bit, but. Yeah, I think, um, maybe if we do a few more questions that are like in the style of like reading them from the chat and we can kind of um push through those and then um maybe kind of have a, a post conversation that's open to people like unmuting and and sharing their ideas about that yeah that's perfect so i'll move right to uh pablo's question uh considering the title of the conference do you think there could be any correlation of Wu being associated with hubei and the pandemic most likely originating in the same province. Could it be seen as a wake up call for the uh, the world's coming from the darker realms or is it a bit of a stretch? And he added a smiley face on the end of his question. I mean, I think that um, this is absolutely um, something that 
even if it is a stretch, if it's manifesting again in the minds of the people, um, that to me is a mark of of the deities of John Wu. Um, so I think, you know, maybe each person has a different perspective on that. I don't know if I, I don't know. I haven't really asked myself that question um, and I haven't um, necessarily, you know, decided that John Wu specifically necessarily is, you know, the deity that uh, could be kind of prevalent and present over this, this topic. Um, I think that many or any of the ancestors, not only in the Taoist pantheon, but in other world uh, religions and beliefs too, um, are worth um, reaching our minds out to uh, in prayer and intention. And again, looking towards for, for clarity and for guidance, uh, just as we've seen has been such with humans and deities throughout all of time. So I don't have, you know, necessarily any specific commentary on that. I think it's an interesting thought um, to have. Mm, totally. Uh, Rosie has a question. If you could share your thoughts of why it seems women Taoist practitioners beyond martial arts are rare. Uh, perhaps these women are not as visible as you are hidden. Yeah, I think that um, interestingly in China, when we observe Taoism, there's a lot of uh, female practitioners, uh, like that picture of the Zixiao Gong, um, the Purple Heaven Palace, uh, is actually like a, a main Taoist nunnery. It's mostly female practitioners there. Um, and I know the Parting Clouds lineage has uh, a huge line of female uh, masters as well. I think why we don't see it in the West, again, is just uh, because of these social structures that we're working through right now, that we're working on changing. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's, that's just another way that we can intentionally um, highlight uh, female practitioners so that they can come to the forefront and so that we can see living examples of, of what that is. Um, and I think we just need to put like a little more effort into changing those social structures that we fall into. Um, where we're not seeing uh, the female practitioners represented in, uh, as as much in the forefront, um, although I do believe that, that that they're there. Awesome. So I think let's do one more question that's in the chat right now. Let's move towards like a dialogue um, for folks who want to stay. Uh, I create lines says great pre great presentation. Thank you. Can you tell us how much time daily is best invested as a beginner martial artist to gain the initial base strength? stability, et cetera, based on your beginnings at the temples? How is it taught and practiced? Peace and abundance. Um, yeah, I mean, you do what you can. I will say that how I started in the Wushu schools, just like how Master Joe, I'm sure many years of his memories are this schedule. So it's essentially that you wake up before dawn and you train. Um, and, and in the Wuguans, in, this, in the martial schools, we would typically start out the morning pre-dawn running um, and then Qigong and then breakfast, uh, a little bit of a break and then the mid-morning training for two hours. Uh, this is usually uh, Kung Fu basics, forms training, uh, whatever style it is you're working on. Then you break for lunch and rest and then you come back again in the afternoon for another two hours and then dinner. And then in the evenings, you either train again for an hour or you do seated meditation. Um, so that's that's the traditional lifestyle. Um, and I always talk about this at my camps that I, I really um, love that lifestyle. It's it's like this kind of home base to me where I feel most healthy and alive and like this is how life uh, kind of should be um, living in community training like this for many hours a day. Um, but um, for most people, that's not a sustainable schedule. Um, so you do what you can. Um, I do think that in the beginning, to have a big push like that is really helpful to give you a model uh, or a standard to to stick with. Otherwise, you know, if you always, you know, only train like at you know 
70% effort um, and you're like, oh, I'll just kind of mark it today, you know, then the next day it's 70% of 70% and then the next day and so on and so forth. And then your training kind of falls into a very lazy uh, way. Um, but I think, you know, in the beginning training, you know, an hour a day sounds good to me, you know, um, I just think that, yeah, you, you do need to build up that base strength first and then work from there. Uh, whatever you can, can fit in. Awesome. So I think, um, we'll end the recording here. I'll just say thanks for, you know, all of our speakers that were here, uh, Josh, Mingdao, Joshua and Lindsay. Uh, thank you for everyone involved in hosting the conference and thank you for everyone who attended. Um, and this is definitely a case of, you know, fortune within misfortune to have all of you here when, you know, if we were going with the original idea, maybe not everyone could have physically attended this conference. We have people from all over the world. Uh, we really, you know, want to appreciate everyone for tuning in. So we're going to stop the recording here and then we're going to open up uh, microphones. So. Okay.